So I want to get it a sense. How many of you guys have heard of Theranos and the story of it? Okay, quite a few of you. All right. Well, I wanted to give a bit of background and kind of take you guys back in time um, about the story before we do the Q&A session. So Theranos. Theranos was a medical diagnostic company and their mission was to redefine diagnosis. And they were doing this with this new revolutionary technology where you were able to take one drop of blood, one drop of blood to run all your blood tests. And so how they did this was with a finger stick. So instead of putting a big scary needle into your arm, you would just need a finger poke and that finger poke would place all your blood in these tiny containers called nanotainers, which then would be inserted into the Theranos devices. And these devices were about the size of a printer. So eventually, you would be able to have a Theranos device in your own home. No longer did you need to go to the doctor or the hospital to get your lab work done. So, the most exciting portion of Theranos, at least for me, was the fact that it was very cheap. You knew exactly how much it was gonna cost you when you wanted to get your blood test done. And for many people, at least in the United States, they wouldn't even need to have health insurance in order to pay for these tests. And so for me, being a starry-eyed, very idealistic, um, recent graduate from UC Berkeley, this mission had really hit close to home for me. So my background, I grew up in a trailer, or I think you guys call them caravans, and there are many um, kind of false assumptions that people make about people who live in trailer parks, but there is one really strong reality amongst the American working class, and that reality is Healthcare costs are too damn high to plagiarize a, a politician that, that never was. And the consequence of healthcare costs being so high in the US is that many people will not go to the doctor when they start seeing symptoms. And I had had you know, my friends, my family, my neighbors, and even myself just choosing not to go to the doctor because we were scared of how much it was gonna cost us. And what would end up happening is a very minor condition would end up turning into a very major disease and diagnosis like cirrhosis of the liver or stage four cancer. So, this was an exciting opportunity for me. Working at Theranos was really my opportunity to fulfill a personal mission of mine, which was to alleviate patient suffering. Finally, I could be of service to my friends, my family, and the community that I cared and loved so much, and I could do this by alleviating their pains financially and physically and psychologically. And in addition to that, the company was backed by a really charismatic female entrepreneur. So Elizabeth Holmes had graduated, or she dropped out of Stanford at age 19 to start this company. She had raised 700 million US dollars, and her valuation for the company was nine to 10 billion US dollars. She had um, eccentric qualities, like she would wear the same black turtleneck every day, and she was vegan. She was all the characteristics that we loved in the Silicon Valley. And the love for Elizabeth Holmes didn't stop there. She also managed to onboard a really prolific um, team of politicians to be on her board. So Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, and James Mattis were on her board. And her investors included Betsy DeVos, Rupert Murdoch, and Tim Draper. So aside from being a part of the American elite, the one thread that all these backers had amongst them was none of them had extensive expertise in biotechnology or healthcare. The media also adored Elizabeth Holmes. She was on the cover of Forbes and Fortune magazine, and she was allotted as being the next Steve Jobs, but the next Steve Jobs of the most benevolent of industries, healthcare. 
And really, Elizabeth Holmes was finally a female entrepreneur in a male-dominated Silicon Valley that was a part of the most exclusive community, the Unicorn Club. So what was the problem here? Well, the problem was that the technology didn't work. The Theranos devices were nothing more than wishful thinking and the processes and procedures that we had in place were full of errors and problems. And the worst part of it was they were still testing on patients. To give you an example of these errors, there was one time I was running a patient and I was testing to check what their thyroid status was. So initially I got a high concentration, which is indicative of hyperthyroidism. I ran it again and it was low, it would be indicative of hypothyroidism. And I ran the sample one more time and it was normal. So here I had one patient, three diagnoses, three apparently <laughs> different sizes of their thyroid and three radically different treatments. And so this is just one case example of the types of errors and problems that we were seeing with the medical test at Theranos. And when I ex explain the environment of Theranos to people, I really relate it as the wild, wild west of blood diagnostics. And what they were doing was essentially experimenting on patients without their knowledge and consent and making them believe that they were going to a well-vetted doctor. So being concerned, while I worked for the company, I had approached the CEO of the company, Sunny Balwani, and I said, look, we're seeing tons of issues with the patient results, with the medical devices, and our processes. I, th I think we need to pay attention to this and stop processing patient samples. And his response to me was, what makes you think you're qualified to say that? you need to do the job I'm paying you to do and process patient samples. So after this conversation, I quit the very next day and I had only lasted seven months at Theranos. So before this, I really wanted to give Sunny and Elizabeth the benefit of the doubt. I really thought that perhaps they didn't know what was going on internally within the company. But it became clear to me after that conversation that they just didn't care. It didn't matter how much evidence and how many red flags were popping up and telling them that they needed to stop. They were gonna continue to process patient samples regardless. So at this point, I was heartbroken, but I was lucky that I was approached by a Wall Street Journal reporter, John Carreyrou, and he had heard from other people in the industry and other employees that there were scandalous activities and potentially fraudulent activities going on within Theranos. So he was conducting an investigative report, but before it came out, Theranos went on a witch hunt. They decided to lawyer up with one of the top corporate lawyers in the United States and come after a whole bunch of prior employees. And the concerning thing about this letter isn't so much that it was threatening to sue me and that they were coming after me and trying to get me to implicate other workers within the company. The concerning part was the address. I had just moved apartments and I was staying with a colleague of mine and on this letter that they delivered to me was my colleague's address. So at this point I knew that not only were they coming after me legally but they were physically following me. So freaked out, uh, I called a lawyer, and it's actually pretty funny, after I'd gotten off the phone with the lawyer, I had driven to San Francisco immediately to go into the regulator's office, the Center for Medicaid and Medi-Cal Services, to just spill everything to them. But honestly, I was so scared that I was being followed, I kind of just paced the streets of San Francisco crying, and was really confused on what I should do. So instead, I bought a burner phone, I called CMS on the phone, and I was able to send them an email. And this email had luckily spurred an investigation, and that investigation 
finally revealed the truth that Theranos was in fact putting patients' lives at risk and they shut down their clinical lab so they were no longer able to process patient samples anymore and they had to reimburse the hundreds of thousands of patients that had received their blood testing. So now, Sonny and Elizabeth have faced numerous legal charges against them from class action lawsuits to um, uh, CMS to investor lawsuits and the biggest one that is outstanding at the moment is criminal charges posted by the FBI. And so that has a current um, pending trial date. So through this, though I'm here and very well at InspireFest and, and happy to be here, this experience was filled with an immense amount of fear and anxiety and self-doubt. And I wasn't always sure about what the right thing to do was. But I think the one anchor that made it a bit easier was the reason why I decided to join Theranos in the first place. And this guiding principle and guiding mission that had driven me to want to work for the company was also the one that was able to pull me out of all the chaos and madness and get the clarity on what were the right steps to do the right thing. So fast forward several years later and I had moved to Hong Kong and I was a program director for a technology accelerator called Betatron. And we invest in early stage tech companies and we give them the training and resources to be able to scale and grow their companies all throughout Asia. And what I noticed is that we're very good about teaching startups and tech workers about how to build their products, how to scale them, how to iterate on an MVP, but we never talk about the shadow side of running and operating a startup. And really, we don't have a lot of good resources to know what to do when we face ethical dilemmas in these environments that are very fast paced, very stressful and, and very challenging and often about survival. So what is out there to make sure that companies, tech workers and the startup community can prepare themselves when they approach these ethical challenges? And this was a leading question that prompted myself, Tyler and my founding team to start Ethics and Entrepreneurship and it's a nonprofit where we are trying to explore what are the frameworks, resources, and people that we can integrate into the startup community to make sure that when they face ethical dilemmas, they'll have the resources to know what to do. And hopefully, ethics and entrepreneurship can become as common nomenclature as lean startup or blitz scaling and all these other words that we use to develop these companies. And I wanted to leave you all with a quote that was very powerful for me and was actually uh, given to me um, from an engineer who went through Juicero. It says, just because our temple has been desecrated, it should not allow us to be shaken from our faith. At the end of the day for me, doing something that made an impact and that served patience, I was willing to stand up for that, whatever it took. And so now I want to question all of you, what are you willing to stand up for? And with that, I hope together all of us in this room can grow and build innovations, projects, and companies that not only empower ourselves, society, and in my case, alleviate the suffering that we see in the world. Thank you. Thank you.